that's the other thing too. All of these sessions we're recording and are on that virtual fall webinar page. So if you ever want to go back uh, to look at any content um, from those sessions, that's where they're sitting. Um, so the, the purpose of these sessions are to replace what would normally be our in-person coaches conference, or for those of you that were at Mount St. Louis last year, uh, the kickstart event, um, because we aren't able to gather in, in large groups. So we're going to sprinkle these throughout the next two or three months. Lots of really great content. So you can jump on our website to see who all the remaining speakers are next week. We're really excited. I mean, I'm excited about Kip's presentation tonight, of course. But um, Peter Jensen, who's a sports psychologist, um, who's worked with uh, many Canadian hockey teams, Olympic hockey teams over the years, um, is going to be talking to us, uh, which I'm really excited about. So I suspect that one's going to be uh, a really, really well attended one. Um, so we're going to probably try to go about an hour. There'll be an opportunity for some questions. Um, you can drop all of your uh, questions into the chat and uh, I can ask them or, you know, put your hand up and I can unmute you, uh, whatever you would prefer. And yeah, without further ado, I will pass it over to Kip, who will get uh, us started on the training priorities and fundamentals. Kip. Hello. Hello. Um, cool. There's another go. Um, hi, everyone. I, thanks for, for joining today. I know that uh, discussing fundamentals is not always uh, super exciting, um, but I can tell you that uh, taking a little time to talk about actual skiing today versus all the stuff we're dealing with right now, and I'm sure all of you are, is, uh, is exciting. And this is a conversation that I think has been long overdue. And going back a couple of years, we were discussing with Alpine Canada revising snow stars and we started working on it and it just it requires a lot of bandwidth so what we're going to discuss today i think for most or probably all of you is not new information um, but i still think it's important to bring some focus to it and to to build some common understanding um, of what, what we're working on and what the priorities are um, as a group and it's not meant to be a syllabus of of technique um, but uh, but it, I think it is still good information and good for us to, to talk about together. And a lot of this you can find in the snow stars. It's also in this context, not age specific. You know, there's that fundamentals with the capital F U N dementals uh, that I think is more designed, you know, for age appropriate younger athletes. This is more just talking about what those skills are um, and maybe setting some goals as a province for this year about some some gaps we want to cover so with that uh, i'm going to share my screen So, I mean, first off, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we have a bit of a situation on our hands um, and we may have some, you know, limited ability to travel or, or access terrain that we traditionally access or, you know, all, all manners of things, uh, different disciplines we might have challenges with and accessing different terrain. So, so what can we do? Um, so far, we've been trying real hard with uh, conditioning. Although I understand it's, you know, it, it, it has been a challenge, for, you know, as, as a society to get kids out and playing, but um, we've been working really hard on that. But, but I just put that out as an open question. What can we do with, with limited space? You know, what can we imp improve? What, uh, what gaps can we cover? If we're, if we're playing the long game here and looking at long-term athlete development, what can we do this year, everybody, to, to push everything ahead? And also keeping in mind that, you know, Cape Pace Lindsay came from North Bay across the, uh, the street from a tiny hill. Uh, Lindsay Vaughn's from Buck Hill, Minnesota, you know, like a, a bump, uh, like Adenac. Uh, so what can we do? And, and I think that brings us right to, you know, we can really, really improve ski technical fundamentals and make a big push. 
I just the, the, I showed this slide in a previous conversation, and there will be a couple of, of these at the beginning here. Um, we've talked a lot about culture, and so what things can we do? Uh, we can focus on long-term development, playing the long game, and covering. You know, there, there are a lot of boxes that need to be ticked to 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 get to a, being a World Cup skier. So given whatever challenges they're facing us, what can we do this year? Well, we can cover off technical fundamentals and really, really make those solid and hardwired. And we can also work on this piece. Um, and in this context, the organizational culture, we're, we're focused on strong, coherent, basic assumptions and common vision related to technique and tactics. We can really try to hammer on these things. So from past presentations, um, we, we talked about race specific technical objectives, you know, about, um, you know, as, as athletes develop, it's not just about being able to turn or flex your ankles, but, but using all of that for effect, like to develop speed and power and stability and flow and precision, um, all of these things. And, and this is really, really important for context, that, that information and that knowledge. And we discuss these priorities, the three P's, position on the skis, platform, or support under your foot, outside ski pressure, you know, how the arc works, like engaging the ski right from the top of the turn and maintaining outside ski pressure and carving all the way through the turn, maintaining snow contact, some line considerations. So all of those things are really important and, and context is important. But I think the reality is for, for most of us, even our higher level skiers, we're, we still have some technical gaps. And for a lot of you that are, you know, say particularly U12 and down, this stuff is more for context because it's not really necessarily where you should be working. And I'll give some specific examples as we go along. So yeah, fundamentals, and I apologize for the basic and crudeness of this, but I think it's important. Uh, a fundamental is a central or primary rule or principle on which something is based. And in the context of skills, it's an ability that is necessary in order to perform a task or understand an idea because it is a foundation for other skills. So a lot of the skills we talked about in, you know, in the ability to, to really generate speed through the arc a lot of things have to happen first. Um, and it's a common mistake we made to, to want to skip ahead to the good part and teach young kids, you know, some things we pull from pictures of World Cup skiers that might not actually improve their skiing without some more fundamental groundwork. Um, and so I just want to break that down a little bit. Um, it's really important to develop the fundamentals early poor fundamentals create barriers and fundamentals are something that that skiers work on their whole career um you know we've we've seen david riding training indoors doing essentially picket fence turns you know or doing like the last time we were training indoors last fall there was the, the norwegian world cup team and they were before every session two sessions a day they were out there doing javelin turns they were doing picket fence style turns, uh, you know, was working on timing with the pole and their hip placement, turning their feet, uh, just skidded arcs, practicing balancing on the outside ski, slow sliding, um, transferring weight to the new ski, you know, how all that works, good position. So for young kids, important to start learning and also really important to keep those things moving. And it's also just, you know, in much the same way that somebody going into a gym will do some fundamental movements before lifting anything heavy or doing anything really explosive. These are good things for warm up to make sure the machine is running properly before stepping on the gas. I apologize for uh, the fade between me. Robin pointed out to me that it's kind of irritating, but I couldn't figure out how to change slides without it. So apologies. So here's a list and it might not be extensive, but this is pretty consistent with what's in the, um, the snow stars document. Um, and you know, you can read a little more about what each of these things are, but I, I want to walk through it and just talk a little bit about what each of these things means to me. Um, and if anyone sees it differently, please pipe up. Um, so stance and balance, you know, in the context of, 
um, higher end racing, we, we define this a little more aggressively, but just for your average skier, a natural balance position on the skis, your ability to flex your ankle, um, actually all three joints, but it is impossible to be in a balanced position standing up without being able to flex your ankle, the quiet upper body and hands forward. Steering, so let's start from the bottom up. The ability to turn your feet and, and turn the skis using your, not just your feet, but your lower leg and lower limbs to turn the skis in the direction of travel. This is something that I remember from when I was a kid racing. Um, the feet are the engine. And you know, some coaches for some reason like to get away from the idea that you wanna turn your feet and talk more about ankle engagement and power in the ski, and that's fine. But as a basic fundamental skill and having the ability to do like using your lower limbs in a coordinated way, it's really important to be able to turn your feet and use your lower limbs in a coordinated way. And a common mistake would be to try to achieve this by pushing the heel. It's really important to be able to turn using your foot, almost like you're pulling, pulling with your toes or the front of your feet. And they should be able to do this both feet together or independently. I would say if they can't, this is where it all ties into your position. If they can't turn their feet properly, they're probably either having a problem with the skill itself or they're not in the right position. Edging and pressure control. So yeah, just the lateral movement of ankle, knee and hip to create edge angle. Pressing, pressure, which is the application of uh, flexion or force or managing external forces to uh, put pressure on the ski. And then control is basically these things for effect. Um, this is maybe a good place to, to discuss like what I think is a common mistake. Um, we really want skiers that fundamentally from the beginning can be in a good position, use their feet to turn and also use the lower joints. I would say a common mistake is to try to emulate higher end skiers too early and to use too much hip or to try to try to create too much edge angle without the pressure component. So we know from our other presentation that we want racers to be able to pressure the outside ski balanced over the skis from the top of the turn all the way through the turn. What I've seen a lot of is athletes move their center of mass away and try to create a big angle with somewhere between not much and zero pressure at the top of the turn. Um, and then they're trying to manage their balance through the turn and end up loading up beneath the gate. So if we can have skiers that are in just a simple, balanced, natural position that are able to engage their ankles and knees and engage the outside ski that way to control pressure, this I think is, is a first step toward being able to carve properly. Timing, coordination, basically this all together. Now, skiing is extremely complex. Um, and if we look at the amount of time that we actually spend skiing in a day, uh, it's not much. So I think really trying to put together that piece of lower body coordination um, and all the pieces together in simple ways, as simple as possible in mastering the timing of those things um, we'll get to pole plant and some other things in a second, but learning that timing and coordination of being able to turn your feet, roll your ankles and knees, uh, timing with the pole and, and moving over terrain, if you can really hammer that. Some of the more advanced things will come a lot easier later because it is complex. So pole plant, um, first of all, they'll need to have their hands up. Um, and swing the basket using their wrist and forearm like this. We want to teach a solid pole plant and it helps with timing and stability. Now on this, I can think of racers that I've seen even recently in our uh, quiver that uh, can carve a ski like crazy, but they ski with their hands in their pockets. Uh, and then they lift their hand up like this to block or like this, I don't know if you can see my hands. 
um, versus swinging the pole. And, and I think when they are like, they have tension across their shoulders and they don't learn how to do this, I think it prevents separation. I, I wouldn't know what goes on physiologically or psychologically to, to, to cause that, but athletes that are really blocked with their arm movements and do not learn how to swing their pole properly, um, have trouble generally with separation. And something I often say to, you know, athletes that are 17 years old or 18 years old that, that haven't quite learned how to pole plan, um, or keep their hands low, even though they're a good skier is, is the question, what world cup skier have you seen, uh, that carries their hands down by their pockets? And there are none, there are zero. So whether some coaches feel that, um, pole plant is an old school technique you can say that it is not and uh, if it's an old school technique how come there are no world cup skiers that ski with their hands low they do does not exist and the last thing i'll say about this is if anyone was watching solden on the weekend lucas bratton won he's a, a junior and uh, remember remember johnny davidson in his presentation to us talked about him and he said that last year just last year they spent three days doing steering turns, working on timing with the pole, uh, just because he had never put all that together. And he won a World Cup this weekend. Uh, so I think that, you know, that for me, sews it up. We need all Ontario athletes to have their hands up and learn to properly swing and plant the pole. Now, separation, this isn't really a, a, a fundamental skill, but it's something that definitely comes up, and I think it's worth talking about. Um, so, as I said, you know, it, it's super complicated. You know, what, you know, your feet are doing one thing, your, your joints are rolling laterally and forward at the same time. Your body needs to be stable. Your hands are forward. The pole is swinging, looking where you're going. So, you know, the, the separation of upper and lower body is a, sorry, a good place to start. So in, in a basic sense, when we talk about separation, we talk about, you know, a quiet, stable upper body and a good, in a good position, balanced position with active lower joints. A more advanced version of separation is, you know, the, the separation with the shoulders using th thoracic rotation or your thoracic spine. And um, what I've seen is a lot of younger kids um, and I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say a lot of really focusing on separating into the fall line with very little going on in their lower joints. So I think even though for sure World Cup skiers and even advanced skiers that are trying to put a lot of force on their ski, they will, you know, use that kind of separation and really pressure the skis. Uh, but if they can't just keep, the racers can't just keep their upper body facing down the hill in a quiet way and perform actively with their lower joints, apply pressure all the way through the turn, they're not gonna be able to do that properly. So as a priority, just body facing down the hill, hands forward, you know, active lower joints and working together and, and that ability to pressure the ski all the way through the turn. As they develop, you know, some might be able to develop more advanced ideas of separation, you know, reasonably early, but Definitely first, we want simple ability to separate lower and upper body. Understanding the arc. So this is another one. Um, I think carving is one of the fundamentals that's in the snow stars in their list. Uh, but basically, yeah, putting, putting together edging and pressure and weight transfer to, to, to carve and put energy in the ski. And I, I kind of wonder if, and, I, and I'm not an expert in, in when to teach everything, but I would, I think I would like to see athletes understand from a younger age, the concept of pressuring through the whole turn. And I guess what I'm getting at specifically is, is, you know, young kids are, are often taught that they do need to flex and extend, but not necessarily how and the timing of all that stuff. And what we see a lot of is that, that sort of starting the turn and extending a lot with the whole body, um, you know, right in the apex. And for sure, first we need to teach the kids to move. So they need that ability to do it. But 
if they get that skill, if we can put that together with pressuring the outside ski all the way through the turn, moving forward and that weight transfer to the new ski to maintain snow contact. Um, I think that would be good to try to implement from a younger age so that we don't have to later, you know, teach them that there isn't a popping motion and that the extension is actually a movement forward um, while the ankle opens up. I hope that's not too complex for, for the, you know, this discussion. We also want to, you know, look just focus on the long-term development um, and age appropriate objectives. I think common gaps are, are, you know, skipping ahead. And I think I mentioned this and I, I see a lot of it, but, or getting stuck in the basics. And that's where I think the context of really trying to study and understand the mechanics of higher end skiing uh, without necessarily teaching it. But what I've seen from time to time is kids or, or coaches do it awesome job with all those fundamentals but there's a gap with moving that through to 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 beginning to get more out of the ski and you know and and, and developing some higher end some higher end skills the other thing and my other term for this is the mealy principle uh the brian mealy principle is it isn't all about technique um, and you know, just there are lots of ways of talking about this, and it's reflected in snow stars. But if we look at physical literacy as a vocabulary of fundamental movement and sports skills, or I mean, that's the the, the physical definition. And the broad definition being motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge, understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities for life. Ski literacy is that same thing, but on skis. Skiing is a whole world onto itself. It's one of those few sports that we spend the whole day doing, you know, the whole day, multiple days doing on all kinds of environments. And it takes a long time to learn. So it's, it's a whole universe of de developing literacy all by itself. So it's, it's really important that we don't focus too much on only technique um, or the athletes become too internal and they need to, to look out and develop all these other skills. And, you know, a, a sports science term, term for this is, is decision training, which sounds like a, a fancy term for what, you know, this context, but all that means is, you know, when we're going down the hill, there's a lot, there are constant decisions to be made. Getting into a race, there are constant decisions to be made. And so if we focus too much on complex technical ideas, they become too internal. And I, and I would say that can be related to low finish rates. So they need to um, develop those simple technical ideas, but in a broad range of environments. And I think a great way to do this, this is also from the Snow Stars, these ABCDEFs. A great way to do it is to set challenges. Like I think there's a, a time for slow, very focused technical work where they can, um, what's the word, look for acquisition to learn a skill, but also, you know, to develop all of those other elements to just set challenges and maybe have a simple technical focus and get them to send it. And when I go back to the Mealy principle, you know, Brian, um, he was, I don't know if, if anyone remembers, uh, or this is going back a while, but he had uh, K2 slalom champions multiple times. And he, whether I worked him with a, as a coach or as a kid, he was never very technical. It's not that he didn't know what he was talking about. It just wasn't necessarily a primary concern for him. And some coaches would look at it and say, well, you know, he's, he, he doesn't really understand or he's, he's not that good because he doesn't talk about these things. But the bottom line is he, for all of that, was able to develop slalom skiers over and over and over again. And what he would do is he had simple, simple technical objectives and he would set challenges. Sometimes he wouldn't even talk to us that much. Uh, but it could be as simple as, you know, he would change the course all the time and he would set GS, GS courses through moguls. Uh, we had to finish, we had to try really hard, uh, but just do it. And the kids get into it and they, they develop a sense of play, which brings it back to that whole 
physical literacy, ski literacy idea that developing skills with a sense of play mm -hmm. and and being able to uh, sorry um, just being able to develop over time and not get in their way too much but let them let them work it through so develop agility develop balance work on coordination diverse environments you know and um, multiple environments and, and and obviously a lot of fun now this, Cam Steven helped me put this together. Thanks very much, Cam. Uh, this is not uh, meant to be set, meant to be set in stone. You'll probably have seen other ones like this, like Sasha Rurik from the US ski team has his slalom priorities one. But I think it's just a good way of looking at, you know, what for kids, what what are the priorities and how are they going to learn? And so, you know, stance and balance, and then you know, the ability to flex in the ankle and three joints have their feet, you know, what, whatever distance apart, and then make sure they have a stable upper body and learn to control whether in wedge turns, you know, just parallel turns, flex the ankles, the ability to do it and move, uh, developing pole plant and outside ski pressure, carbon. But all the way through this, the things that challenge ad adaptability, um, and visual skills and decision skills. Um, so they develop, you know, freedom in their skiing. A great quote I heard, mind you, it was related to writer's block, but to do something well, you have to do it freely. So if they are, you know, um, super technically focused too much, too often, without challenging it in all these different environments, they, they, they won't be able to do things freely. So this is also very important. And I think this is just a good exercise. Like I said, this is not meant to be uh, the Bible. You can make your own um, mm -hmm. and look at in any training session, whether it's, you know, for a week, a year uh, or whatever, what, what are the priorities? How are they going to develop? I'd also like to talk about drills and exercises. And I think this is somewhere that, you know, we can maybe go as a group this year. There are all kinds of different drills that re refine specific things, you know, hopping, sliding, one ski, skiing on one ski or balancing on one ski, no poles, different pole plant things, and then things that ch challenge uh, the visual aspect. And of course, that's not getting into environments. These are just technical drills. Uh, but I think as a good start, this is a core list of, of drills. If we could have kids by the time they're 14, be able to do proper bricage, proper javelin turns, spies with both feet or hopping foot to foot with timing with the pole, steer, steering turns, you know, where they're balanced over the outside ski. And this could also be, um, you know, glide Christie's, but that vary with tempo and radius. So I think in the last presentation we saw, um, Christofferson doing a slow version, working on position, you know, weight transfer. There's also that same idea, but in a, in a picket fence format where the tempo is higher and it's more just position, um, faster turning with the feet or lower joint activation and pull plant. But it, it's great for just developing tempo, developing timing, developing coordination. There's a whole host of no poles drills, you know, different things you can do with your hands, like this or on your head or like this just but maintaining a disciplined turn position and you know as they get more advanced like making sure they pressure the turn at the top or pressure the ski at the top of the turn and when we talk about discipline it doesn't really count if there's no discipline in the arc so pushing them to say you got to make a 10 meter turn top to bottom with no poles in some different format and again bringing back to we want kids that are able that have this skill like timing and actually planting the pole so you know it, it takes a long time um, and it takes a lot of different environments and again it's important to refine these fundamentals before adv uh, applying advanced technical principles um, i think it's very alluring to try to you know to try to do to, to do those things we see with higher end skiers. Um, but essentially what I would like is to set some goals. And 
we're, we're working on that and thank you for all being a part of it, but developing a common understanding and vision of how to ski and how we're going to talk about skiing. Um, it would be awesome this year if, given that we might be on smaller hills or just our local hill more with limited ability to travel, if we could really master the fundamentals. And I, I don't know, I haven't looked at everyone that's on the call, but I mean, many of you have just as much knowledge as I do, or maybe more about a lot of what this is. If we can drive that with your clubs, drive that with your younger coaches, and make sure we develop really, really solid fundamental skills. We can also work on the, you know, the context and if appropriate, developing advanced racing technique, you know, understanding what, a, what your platform is and developing and generating speed through the arc. Um, but we need to do everything we can in the situation we're in and play the long game. If we can come out of this year with some really, really solid ski technique and cover this gap that we really need to cover anyway, um, you know, maybe by mid season or, or who knows, we'll be back out doing whatever, traveling around, getting back to super G and downhill training. But in the short term, if we can do everything we can, uh, with what we have, then in the long run, you know, this, this shouldn't affect us at all. Um, and that, uh, that's all I have for this. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, comments. Yep. One thing that, um, I know you had taken out of the, the presentation cause it tends to bog it down. Doesn't come through really well. Um, but as some video, Graham was asking if, um, the point you made about pressure throughout the turn, if you had any video evidence or something that he could share with the staff to really, um, drive that, that component home. Well, I'll tell you what is, um, one of the things with, uh, I, it, it came back to me that using video and zoom presentations doesn't work very well. Um, so, and having the type of image that I have access to with higher end skiers for younger skiers, I, I don't have as much of that, but what we can do is between the Ontario team, the U16 group, we can collect video of the drills we want to see and we can post them to our channel and with a description. And what I would also let, love to see uh, as we go along is if any of you from your club have examples of drills that you prefer, like send them to us, submit them to us. And, you know, we can start working on this together um, because for sure we are not the keepers of all the knowledge, but yes, we, and, and Buck, I will send you a link to a great example of that. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I can unmute you if you want to ask any uh, questions and talk ski racing. Happy to unmute anybody if you just want to put your hand up or have any comments. Hey, Robin Graham. Hey, Graham. Just quick following up on that one, Kip. Uh, if it's possible to even have it so that the, the video format is, uh, I have found to be very effective to dump onto the kids' phones. So if it can be in that style of format, everyone seems to have their own device. So if, it, if we send it in packets to you through a, an area that we can download, like I find dropping it to them is very effective. Great. Yeah, and <clears throat> if, if anyone else has ideas about how to advance this, uh, this idea of developing fundamentals across, well, across the province, I, you know, we're, we're all ears. My most recent experience is, you know, with, with adults, basically. And now I'm just sort of getting back into coaching U16s. Um, so, it, you know, ideas welcome about how to reach more people. Um, and, you know, I, I know, as I said at the beginning of the call, I don't think this is earth shattering news, but what I would like to, you know, go on the record as saying is this is something we need to improve like across the board. And, and I did see, you know, and I, I'm not going to mention names, but I can see, I saw skiers last year that were doing a great job of it. 
you know, just good, simple, natural skiing. And when I see that, I think, now that's somebody we can turn into a ski racer, you know, as, as opposed to someone that's had even more training and it's pretty fast, but has developed a collection of bad habits that, you know, now we're going to have to break and change and do, you know, a ton of fundamental work at the provincial ski team level. Uh, so if we can hammer on this stuff early, that, that, that would be great. If anybody has, you know, experience at their club or business on ways that we can, um, to your point, Graham, share the information so and video so it's really easy. Um, it's certainly not one of my strengths, <laughs> video and, and sort of that technology side. So if anyone has any great um, advice on tools we could use it would make it really easy for everyone to share and and uh us to manage it that would be super helpful because i think video is pretty key all right does anyone have any other questions yeah sorry tana's here hey tana's I know what I do for my team is that we do, um, I do a ton of video with my iPhone all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I shared on just um, the U10 group so that the parents can see what the kids are doing and then the kids can see it right away. And cause they're like, no, I'm not sitting back. And then you have video from the front, from the side, from behind. And they're like, oh yeah, you know? And for some reason, um, I just think that if you had like a, a Facebook thing and then everybody can post to it and then people can comment or you can make like a skills section. I mean, you know, video is something huge on my uh, skill mm -hmm. set, but I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't have Facebook, but that would be a great way to create a repository of things that you want to push. And then you can point families to it or coaches or clubs or things like that and say, here's, you know, I love that stuff. Yeah. Well, I might pick your brain, Tannis, because uh, it's certainly not certainly not one of my strengths. But um, yeah, making it as usable for everybody, because as we know, six, like kids versus parents versus coaches sometimes use different platforms. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we have to get our sort of bank of uh, of skills and and video ready to to share as well. So I think that could certainly kick it off. Um, I've got uh, Laura asking uh, who coaches primarily six, seven year old athletes, um, what the best drills are to help enforce some of these primary mm -hmm. fundamentals so they can keep them throughout their ski journey. It's a loaded question for you, Kevin. Well, uh, I think that's a very good one. I think at that age, if I'm remembering the LTAD correctly, they are, you know, they're learning through activities and, and less formal drills. So I think it's been a long time since I've coached a six or seven year old, but you know, I think things like trying to get them to make as many turns as they can and to be active or just promoting movement at all or getting them to, to learn how to, to flex and feel the front of their boot. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about squishing grapes on the front of their boot or, you know, uh, um, how to get them moving outside ski to outside ski and engaging their feet. Um, yeah, that, that type of activity versus a discipline drill. I would imagine at minimum U8, you're getting into, you know, uh, formal drills, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, you know, I welcome anyone's input on that because uh, for sure there are people on this, on this, in this meeting that, that have more experience with it. Uh, Buck just had another great point, which uh, both um, Jeff Lackey um, and Johnny Davidson said the same thing, and I fully agree, which is that it's not just about doing the drills, it's about mastering the drills. And mastering the drills takes time. My experience with uh, drills is when you first introduce it to somebody, they get it pretty well, and then, you know, you, and I'm sure you've all had this experience, a few days later you're riding the lift, and you can tell that they're sort of doing that drill, but it looks a lot different. And I think really get them to understand it, uh, know what it's for, um, know the technical parameters of it, and then refine it and work on it um, over time. 
and I think Kip to add to that that there's not there's 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 you know we there's no magic drill. I, I think what we see and is all the way down from World Cup teams to provincial teams to U16 to our our youngest skiers is is perfecting a drill is very much age dependent. Some drills little little guys are going to do differently because they don't have the strength and the power uh, and all those skills. But you see some some little guys that rip it and can do it no problem. And I, I don't think you can be afraid to expect more uh, from your athletes. That's easier said than done. Uh, but it, it's working through and doing things, you know, perfect practice makes perfect um, type deal. And having high expectations for your drills and coming back to them. But as Kip said, the other balance to that is making sure that they do have flow and freedom in their movement and their skiing. And, and that's the other really big and important part of it is you can't just drill them to death every day. I mean, we drill our provincial team skiers for hours, but we have to get it back into skiing. If your drill work doesn't connect to at speed skiing, what the heck are you doing? Yeah, hi, it's Lisa. I just wanted to make a comment if possible. Yeah. Um, uh, what I've found uh, working with uh, U16s even in the past couple of years, what what is evident is that a lot of them have never learned how to make, like, you know, we're, we want to perfect a pole plant, but they've never really gone through the skills at a younger level to get, to, you know, to have the acquisition of, of math, even coming close to mastering it. And I think, you know, the that we really need to focus on teaching little kids at a younger age when they're just first of all dragging their poles beside them how to use them when they're moving at a slower speed and then you know the skill set might be better by the time they get to u16 sure really breaking you know sort of breaking down each bit of it and i know for the last two years we've spent a lot of time just really going in a slow progression from you know swinging the basket keeping the basket close to the snow keeping the hands at a level you know, level and, and, and it's amazing, you know, even with a group of skiers who are not bad, um, just how difficult they they find it. So, um, and it'll probably be like that for the rest of their lives. It can take time. And, and unless somebody really, I mean, it's just thinking, that's a great point, Lisa. And just thinking back to Lucas Bratton, who's, you know, already racing World Cup, somebody having to take time to say, okay, no, that's not right, and spend a few days, like just saying, let's let's get this. So, um, yeah, it can take time. One thing that I I've I like to do with kids um, as they're learning because they 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 seem to have trouble with it, and and even the you know the the amount of effort it takes to swing the pole properly, I get them to hold their hand forward or their arm forward, um, and then I hold my hand up and get them to hit my hand with their with their basket. And normally what they'll do is uh, swing their pole very softly. And then I say, no, harder, 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 until they start swinging their pole with enough force that it might actually be in time with the ski turn. Um, you know, and then you can at least get them to understand the, the effort and motion mechanic of using their forearm and wrist. Yeah, and I, another part of the, what I found really interesting too is you know, what do they do after they make the pull, pull plant that the, you know, the hand tends to drop down and, um, and so I trying to create a focus with the kids of once you've made the pull plant, follow through and keep the hand high. And, uh, you know, one of the little drills that I have with it is just trying to have them draw an, a comma in the snow. So breaking it down, you know, one turn at a time where when you've made the pull plant and you're moving, I still want to see the tip of the pole draw an arc in the snow. And it just gives them a real awareness of that inside hand and what, you know, so they don't get that dropping feeling or dropping to the inside. Absolutely. I feel like we could do some of these webinars um, with just you guys talking about how to get kids to master certain 
skills, you know, based on your experiences, you know, just even the conversation of, you know, what Lisa just added to the conversation. I think that's a worthwhile uh, experience right there. But if, if you guys, and if anyone wants to speak up, please, please do if they have any specific questions. But um, my question to the group is, as we're um, moving towards a, a season where there's a lot of unknowns in regard to our competition and how much hill space we're going to get and it, what that hill space is even going to be, um, you know, what sort of tools uh, or resources other than that sort of video library we were just talking about would you as coaches, program directors um, like to see to help support what you're trying to execute this year from us? anyone has any comments now or later please uh please share them with us and um we'll do our best to get it for you i can unmute you or you can unmute yourself in the chat or if you have any other specific questions for kip robin it's graham again we can share this video correct with uh our sure. parent groups now Yep. So I think Kip, having you as you have today really gives us more credibility as well as our coaches just to be able to have this video to reference back mm -hmm. um, so that it doesn't get misinterpreted or, 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 you know, everyone tries to spin it in their own angle, but at least it gets us from the same platform. I thought we made good headway last year with trying to get our three principles that we we're getting through. And I think it made good, teaching conversation anyway. So I think this just continually builds on it. Now we need to make sure the, the videos match and that like you say, we have some age specific drills. Uh, Volleyball Canada, for example, does a great Facebook page where they interact and share on it. And it seems to catch a lot of good, uh, a good feedback. Why don't you empower Brian McGregor to, uh, to run that thing? I, that guy would make it the best thing ever as far as coordinating yeah. all the drills and putting it in a... Uh, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look like Nick wants any uh, resources <laughs> put towards that from his perspective. Yeah. Brian would do it volunteer on his own time at night. <laughs> He's more passionate than many. Well, I, I appreciate that, Graham. I mean, I, again, like I know this, this has been long on generalities and a little short on specifics with, you know, video or, or instruction. But I think an important thing, and I'm just going to share an anecdote, which is that you know, last year, getting ready for a U16 camp in Chile, I had a parent reach out. They were trying to decide what they wanted to do with their with their son and said, well, I heard, you know, you're going to do a lot of technical work uh, because, you know, maybe some kids need that. But, you know, my son's really good, so he, he doesn't need to do those fundamentals because we had it in the description. And from my perspective, I, I don't I don't see any skiers, and that includes the Ontario ski team, that they can't really improve their fundamentals and their, their technique. So I, I think, you know, if we can uh, all hold hands on this one, that we're going to improve technical skiing and fundamentals uh, because, you know, I think there is pressure out there to jump ahead and to, you know, to try to ski like Ted Ligety with a huge arm outside arm swing and all sorts of things. And I think if we can get back to, to really trying to make great skiers, I'm not saying we need to be overly technically focused, but if we can get back to, to being great skiers first and develop those other skills. And, you know, you, you probably all know this, but the, you know, those, those core central European nations that are really good at ski racing, it's their technical foundation, their coaching model is really tied to instruction. Um, and I was going to ask Cam, I don't know if Cam McKenzie's still on, but Cam Steven, like how much time, as a percentage, do you think you spent at this last camp focused on fundamentals and technique? Sorry, or just doing technical work? Uh, with the girls, I, I spent a little more than Cam did, probably an extra day, but our, so we had a 19 day ski camp. And the first five days of the camp, we did not go into gates. Um, we technically, technical free skied every day. Um, in those first five days with, with different focuses, but um, we spent a lot of time. Um, so the first five days, and then when we arrived in Sauce Bay, uh, we definitely did another full day of, of drills and technical free skiing. So that would be a six of 19 days. 
Uh, and then with the girls, they did four warm up runs every morning of, of technical skiing. Uh, and we talk about warm ups uh, as their time to practice and move through their technical progressions. And then most days after the course, we would do three to four runs. So I would say over half of our volume would, would have been in some form of technical ski, not all slow technical skiing, um, but a, I would say close to nearly 50% of our volume would be in, in, in very technically focused ski. And, and I would say throughout the season uh, and Kip, if people ever want to see our, our tracking models that we used last year, I would say nearly 20% of our skiing volume in a year with our guys is probably in drill work and probably 20, you know, another 10 to 15% of that in technical skiing outside of gates. It's, it's huge, huge, huge. And our philosophy on that is that you work the skiing, you build the car outside the course. And when you're in the course, you work on the driver. Or the tactics. Right. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and these are obviously higher end skiers. So I, I think uh, you know, ski free skiing is training. It's learning. It's all. It's all relevant for sure. And and we're fortunate to be in in locales with with some of the best skiers in the world. Uh, we watch Zenhauser do enormous amounts of technical skiing. Um, we saw um, riding again, doing it. We saw the Austrian women's team, the Swiss team, that there, there is no cutting corners with this. And to any parent or any coach that thinks their age group skier, whether it's at a provincial team or a U6 or anywhere in the middle, has it all put together, uh, I would say they just don't fucking get it. <laughs> Sorry for my language, but you know, you are always improving technically, whether it's in full speed technical skiing or in drill work. That, that's how we get better. Okay. Sorry for the language. It's okay. I, uh, we don't contone that kind of language, but that, uh, that's, uh, that was refreshing. Um, so what we can do moving forward and we intend to do is, is provide examples. Um, and provide video and post it. And we have some other ideas about that, but at least we can start to get some really good examples out there and, and some consistent work. And, you know, as, as I said, if, if by the time kids hit U16, they have a lot of these basic basics mastered, we can, we can start to do some really cool stuff. And Nick and I are just chatting back and forth. Um, I think a lot of us have video probably oodles and oodles and years and years of video, um, but it's getting it to a point that it's pretty as Kip's or as uh, Nick says, that is actually easy to watch and is well produced, which is um, another piece of the puzzle. So um, that's something for us to work through, but that's to, in my mind, one of the more challenging uh, components of it um, just to get it. So it's actually good, high quality. And we don't have to hire a, you know, video production company that costs a lot of money. Gordy, do you know anyone like that? Gordy still on the call? Uh, he sure is. Uh, yep. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Family discount rate, right? You bet, guys. Put a pot of coffee on and I'll bring over some video. <laughs> And Kip, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to say to the group, and then I'll be quiet, but, you know, when we talk about technical skiing, when you go back to your A, B, C, D, E, Fs, uh, I think that's a really good model, and, and, and it's not just drill skiing. Flow is huge. Uh, at the end of the day, ski racers, when we compete, we ski fast, and all those decisions you talked about, and that gets enhanced by free skiing. <clears throat> and fun skiing and playing on skis as much as the drill work and the younger the athletes get the more important it becomes um, but at all levels um, 
you have to be able to ski everywhere and make decisions on the fly and and making little robots also won't help us so i think to all of our coaches we've got to balance that that good technical skiing with are you a good technical skier at speed? It doesn't matter if you can do bricage, if you can't take what you're working on in bricage and turn it into, uh, you know, top level GS or top level super G downhill slalom. It has to transfer back. And and part of the skill set that we're looking for gets established by having fun. And as Kip alluded to, there are a hell of a lot of good skiers that come from very small ski hills and and you're only limited by your imagination. Um, ski cross courses, parks, bumps, trees, uh, that general skiing athleticism is equally as important. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't technical ski, you have to put in the technical miles, but on the other side, don't think that it, it just has to be slow speed skiing. Yeah, there is such a thing as, as doing too much slow stuff, for sure. Thanks, thanks, Cam. Lots of other great ideas here in the, in the chat, too, so thanks, everybody. To be continued. You got it. Thanks, everyone, for uh, calling in tonight, and um, Please uh, log on for our session next week with Peter Jensen. That'll be another really great one. But keep the ideas coming. And if you guys have any resources you can share uh, to help us kind of move that this initiative forward, that would be uh, super helpful. And there's a couple of you that have mentioned you're willing to help out. So I'll reach out to you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. You too. Take care. Bye, everyone. Skinner. Yes. Skinner. Yes. Where are you, Robin Skinner? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't walked away yet. What would you like, Bradford? Um, actually, you... let me let me hold on. Let me start. Let's. I'm gonna stop recording. How about that? That will work too. But. I...